Good afternoon. Welcome to the Gatewood Well Solutions and Hush Blackwell CARES Act Individual and Small Business Update. This is Christina Shockley, and I am here with Jessica Zaratsky and Kristen Salzman, who work on the CARES Act resource team at Hush Blackwell and have been working extensively as a resource for small businesses owners developing content and determining how best to access available assistance during this time. As most of you are aware, the COVID-19 pandemic has prompted the U.S. government to respond with the Coronavirus Aid, Relief, and Economic Security CARES Act, the largest economic stimulus plan in history. This act is intended to assist businesses and individuals during this period of uncertainty. This broadcast today will focus on some of the individual provisions that may benefit our clients, as well as focus on the major programs and initiatives that are available from the Small Business Administration. Today, I will give a quick update on the individual relief granted by the CARES Act, including an explanation on the recovery rebates and the waiver of required minimum distributions. Then I will turn the microphone over to Jessica and Kristen for the small business specifics to the Paycheck Protection Program, the Economic Injury Disaster Loan, and the CARES Act Midsize Loans. As an individual update, the recovery rebates are probably one of the hottest topics. These are also known as the economic impact payments. All U.S. residents with adjusted gross income of $75,000 or 150,000 for married, married filing jointly are eligible for a full rebate in the amount of $1,200 or $2,400 for a married couple. The individuals must not be a dependent of another taxpayer and must have a work eligible social security number. This rebate is phased out for $5 for every $100 of adjusted gross income over these amounts and phased out completely for incomes exceeding 99,000 for a single filer, 146,000 as a head of household with one child, or 198,000 for a joint filer with no children. In addition to that payment, if the individual or couple are within the AGI limits and have a child under the age of 17, they will be eligible for an additional $500 per child. According to the new law, the IRS is going to first look first at your 2019 tax return to compute this payment. If no 2019 return has been filed yet, the IRS will look at your 2018 return instead. This is important as you could potentially qualify for this rebate in one year, but not in the other. For example, if you have not filed your 2019 tax return yet and your income in 2019 is over those AGI thresholds, but your income in 2018 was under those thresholds, you may want to wait to file your tax return. Alternatively, if your income was under the threshold in 2019 and you recently had a child this year, you should wait to file your tax return as soon as possible. I'm sorry, last year, you should wait to file your tax return as soon as possible. You should file your tax return as soon as possible so that you get the additional $500. Please note, these rebates are considered an advance of your 2020 tax return credit. This means that even if you did not qualify based upon your most recently filed tax return, that you can still qualify for this credit depending upon your 2020 adjusted gross income. However, the credit will not be provided until you file your taxes in 2021. With that being said, if you received a rebate based on your 2018 or 2019 adjusted gross income and your 2020 adjusted gross income would have disqualified you, you do not have to pay the rebate back. Your rebate will be transmitted either electronically or by paper check, depending upon how you received a refund or paid your taxes on your last filed tax return. Just to note, these rebates are not taxable to you, so they do not count as income. I have offered a resource 
and I will send it after with the, the information from this webinar, to a link to a TurboTax calculator so that you can use to calculate your economic income impact payment depending upon your specific situation. The next big update was the waiver of required minimum distributions. The CARES Act waives required minimum distributions for 2020. The waiver of the RMDs applies to any account owner who is 72 years old or older in 2020. Any account owner who turned 70 and a half in 2019 did not take their required minimum distribution in 2019 and plan to take their delayed required minimum distribution by April 1st of 2020 and also beneficiaries of inherited IRAs for individuals who passed away prior to 2020. If you have taken an IRA distribution that you do not need within the past 60 days, you may be able to put that money back into your IRA using the 60 day rollover. Keep in mind that you are only allowed one transaction per 12 month period measured from the date that you receive that distribution. However, outside of that 60 day rollover period, we are still seeking guidance on whether or not the required minimum distributions that were already taken for 2020 can be rolled back into the IRA. In 2009, the last time that there was required minimum distribution relief, the IRS did allow that RMDs made could be rolled back inside of the, of the IRA outside of that 60 day rollover period. We will continue to update you on that situation. This means that there are now additional opportunities for tax planning if the, re if the required minimum distribution is not needed to fund expenses. One possible tax strategy is to convert the traditional IRA to a Roth IRA in the amount of the required minimum distribution for 2020 that no longer needs to be taken this year due to the waiver. This way, you would be able to move funds from a tax exempt environment while maintaining your anticipated level of taxable income. Another example of using this waiver in a tax efficient manner is to take only the amount of the distribution that would bring your income up to the top of the tax bracket you are currently in without going over that tax bracket. That would, that would basically be called a strategy called tax bracket management. This is trying to alleviate you from the amount of the required minimum distribution that would push you into the next higher tax bracket. Now, I will turn the microphone over to Jessica and Kristen to provide you with some information regarding opportunities available to small businesses. Uh, this is Kristen Salzman, and I am going to spend some time talking about the Payroll Protection Act. This act is a part of the stimulus plan, the CARES Act, and it provides $349 billion of liquidity to small businesses. And the way this works is that in, in, at a very high level, the government is going to give eligible institutions, and we'll go through what those are, a loan um, that is subject and eligible for forgiveness. So in essence, you'll hear this being called free money because if, if you're eligible for the money and if you use the money for um, the required um, permissible purposes um, and you maintain your employment uh, levels at, at where, they were, where they are, then you are eligible for a forgiveness. So I'm going to start out, um, I'm going to take a step back actually and talk a little bit about the background of the CARES Act and, and explain a little bit of what I'm saying. The CARES Act um, was passed on Friday, March 26th. And one week later, the president declared that money should be um, available for distribution under this act. As a result of that accelerated pace, the, both the SBA and the Treasury have been racing to try to come up with regulations and answers to all the questions that this act um, poses. And so literally, I am not exaggerating, when I say daily, there are updates to and changes to how this act is interpreted, both its applicability, the amount um, that you're eligible for, et cetera. 
So the best advice that I can give to any business owner that would like to determine whether it is eligible for this, this program is one, to find a banker. And it's very important to hopefully the bank with which you have a relationship is an eligible SBA lender. You want to make sure that the bank with whom you are talking is an eligible SBA lender. And the second thing, practical piece of advice that I can give you is to constantly look at both the SBA's website and the Treasury's website. Personally, I find the Department of Treasury's website a little bit clearer and easier to navigate because these rules are constantly being updated and reinterpreted every, every day. I'm going to start out with eligibility. Basically, these loans um, are available to small businesses with fewer than 500 employees or uh, the number of employees that um, is permissible under the, if it's a higher number, certain, um, certain companies with certain NAICS codes that have a higher number of eligible employees can have more than 500. So you're going to want to look at the SBA um, website and it will tell you um, it will provide you a link in which you can put in your NAICS code and determine whether or not you can have more employees. It is, it is available to sole proprietors, independent contractors, and certain other self-employed individuals. It's also expanded to apply to 501c3s with fewer than 500 employees and veterans organizations organized under 501c19. Um, another carve out for people with, with more than 500 employees are uh, provided to businesses in the accommodation and food services industries. There, the requirement is you have no more than 500 employees in one location. Now, when determining whether or not you have 500 employees, the SBA is going to apply a traditional affiliate test meaning that it's going to look to any entity um, with, that, that shares a common ownership or a common control with other entities. So if one entity owns more than 50% of the voting stock of another entity, or the entity shares common management, common presidents, common board of directors, those entities will have to be aggregated for determining whether the 500 person test is made. There are certain exceptions to these affiliation rules, which are very complex. And if you feel that you have an affiliation situation um, in your organization, I recommend strongly that you reach out to your advisor to help you um, weed through all of those rules. But the affiliation rules are exempted for companies that have a NAICS code that begins with 72, certain franchises, and certain businesses who have obtained financing from an SBIC lender. Um, another additional requirement is that the borrower has to be in operation as of February 15, 2020, and has to have paid salaries or um, made payments to independent contractors at that time. And they have to be able to certify that the uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus uh, pandemic has created uncertainty that has adversely impacted their business. So it's important to note that these are not um, need-based loans. You don't have to prove a demonstrated need, such as you have no other sources of cash, which are traditional for the traditional requirement for SBA loans. You're eligible if you have the size requirements and you can otherwise make the certifications set forth in the application. Christina, I think we can switch to the next slide. Um, in determining what the maximum amount of the loan is, it's really at its basic uh, two and a half times the average monthly payroll cost um, or $10 million. So it's, it's the lesser of $10 million or two and a half times your average monthly payroll cost. In determining, and this is one of the areas where I, I mentioned earlier, uh, this slide has already been uh, preempted by some um, Treasury Q&As that came out this afternoon. But you can basically pick either the, your payroll cost 
during the one year period prior to the date you apply for the loan, not the date on which the loan is made, it's the date on which the application, they came out and clarified that, or 2019. And what is included in the, the payroll costs um, includes salary, wages, commissions, payments of cash, tips, or the equivalent payments for vacation, parental, family, medical, sick leave, um, separation payments, payments required for the provision of group health care benefits, payments of any retirement benefits and the payment of any state or local tax assessed on the employee. One of the things that's very important in making this calculation is any cash compensation paid to an employee in excess of $100,000 has to be excluded from this amount. And they this was another thing that was clarified today that the $100,000 cap only applies to cash compensation not the total full in cost of employing the person. So if, if their compensation is $95,000 and you provide them $10,000 of healthcare benefits, you get to include the $105,000. It's just the cash compensation to employees in excess of $100,000. That is excluded. Um, in calculating this amount, uh, the payroll costs do not include um, certain payroll taxes, um, any compensation of an employee who does not have a principal place of residence in the United States, um, qualified sick and family leave wages for which you've already received a credit under the um, Families First Coronavirus Response Act, and certain amounts paid to independent contractors. So most banks are in the process of developing a easy calculator which will allow you to put all of these inputs in and it will help you spit out a number of what your your baseline eligible payroll costs are and then you you take that amount and you multiply it by two and a half times um christina the next slide so we went over that um next slide how are the loans forgiven one of the things before I get into how before how the loans are forgiven is that these loans can only be used for certain um, payments. They can only be used for payroll costs, costs to continue group health care benefits, payments of interest on mortgage obligations, rent, utilities and interest on any other debt obligation that was incurred before February 15th. So that is what you can use the, um, the proceeds of the payroll protection loan for. If you use the proceeds during the eight week period after you actually receive the loan and you use those, the amount you receive on payroll costs, payment of interest on mortgage, payment of rent, and utility payments. And I note very, I want you to note very clearly that while you can use the loan for interest on other debt, if you do, it's not subject to forgiveness. You have to, if you want an amount forgiven, you have to use it on these four permissible, um, um, these four permissible types of payments. And you must maintain your employee count basically at what it was at the time you got the loan. If you, you, they will apply um, in determining the amount of loan forgiveness, the SBA will reduce the amount of, el of the loan eligible for forgiveness by a factor or a ratio depending, com depending on your a comparison of your employment status in 2020 versus 2019. So they want you to maintain your employees. Um, there is also another cap on the amount of the loan forgiveness and 70, you can only, well, you can say it one of two ways, at least 75% of the loan proceeds must be used for payroll costs to be eligible. So if you use all of the loan on payroll costs, it's all eligible to be um, forgiven. If you use more than, if you only use 
the amount of the loan for 75 and you use the other 25 for rent or utilities, that's fine. But if you use 30% of the amount of the loan for rent and utilities, the amount over 25% will not be eligible for forgiveness. So they want most of this money being used to support your payroll costs. So they've capped out the amount of, of the loan proceeds that you can use for costs other than payroll costs at 25%. Um, Christine, I think the next slide. And so that, as I said, that is a very high level overview of the Payroll Protection Act. Um, and and I, I can't stress again, if, if, if you're very interested in getting this type of, of loan, you need to reach out to your banker as soon as possible. There's talk of, of, the, of the $349 billion being um, exhausted in a matter of days or weeks. While there's hope that the Congress will come back at the end of April and um, appropriate more funds for it, there is an element of a race to the door to get these loans. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jessica, who's going to provide an overview of the economic injury disaster loans. So good afternoon. Thanks again for joining us today. I hope all of you are well. Um, as was mentioned, my name is Jessica Zaratsky. And I'm a partner in um, the financial services team at Hush Blackwell, and I'm located in our Milwaukee office. Um, and so the PPP loan program that Kirsten just discussed has understandably so, uh, for many of the reasons that she just discussed, have been the focus for small businesses. But we also wanted to take a couple of minutes of your time this afternoon to highlight another form of relief that's available to eligible small businesses. And that is the SBA's Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program. And you may also hear it being referred to as an EIDL or a disaster loan. And what an EIDL is, is it's a low interest federal loan that's issued directly by the US Treasury. So whereas the PPP loans that Kirsten was just talking about um, are being issued directly by SBA approved lenders. Uh, this program is directly through the SBA with funds coming directly from the US Treasury. And applicants can fill out an application directly on the SBA's website. So the recently passed CARES Act did add $30 billion to the disaster loan fund. And these loans are available from January 31st through December 31st of 2020. So who, who's eligible for these disaster loans? Well, in addition to small businesses and private nonprofits, we now have sole proprietors, independent contractors, cooperatives, employee-owned businesses, and tribal small businesses with 500 or fewer employees that are eligible for these disaster loans. Uh, one big point to note is that the borrower must have been in operation since January 31st, 2020, when the COVID-19 public health crisis was announced. Um, so some of the key details of these loans that we wanted to pass along to you today are that the maximum amount of that loan is $2 million. The interest rate is set, and that's 3.75% for small businesses, and then 2.75% for most private nonprofits. And while that interest will begin accruing on day one that the loan is made, the payment is going to be automatically deferred for at least 12 months. And then the term of the loan can be up to 30 years. That will be in the discretion of the SBA. Any loans that are under $200,000 do not require personal guarantees, but for any loans that will be in excess of $200,000, the SBA will still require personal guarantees from the principals of the business. And the maximum unsecured loan amount is $25,000. So this means that any loan that is going to be over $25,000 will need to be secured by collateral and that can be real property or personal property, again, as determined by the SBA. 
And then finally, the SBA has waived its credit elsewhere test. And this means that small businesses that have credit available elsewhere are now eligible for disaster loans um, with respect to the COVID-19 declaration for disaster, whereas under the um, prior disaster loan program, um, this was a requirement. So now small businesses do not need uh, to show that it doesn't have credit available elsewhere. That's waived. Um, this is a working capital loan, so therefore the funds can only be used for specific purposes. Uh, these are not intended to replace lost sales or profits, and instead the funds can only be used to pay fixed debts and payroll, accounts payable, rent or mortgage payments, and then some other bills that could have been paid had the COVID-19 declared disaster not occurred. Um, also part of this CARES Act, while we have the disaster loan fund of $30 billion, the CARES Act also established a $10 billion emergency grant under the disaster loan program. And these grants are backdated to January 31st, 2020, so that we can allow those who've already applied for disaster loans to be eligible to also receive the grant. Um, some of the key details about this emergency grant. Um, so an eligible entity that has applied for the disaster loan via the SBA website due to COVID-19 can also now request an advance on that loan up to $10,000. So while that loan application is pending and you're waiting for an SBA loan officer to contact you and to work through the details of your application, you can request an advance of up to $10,000. The applicant in doing so has to certify that it is an eligible entity under the SBA guidelines. And then the SBA is required to distribute that emergency advance to the applicant within three days of the applicant's request. And then that advance can be used towards eligible expenses, including paid sick leave to employees, payroll, increased cost of materials, rent or mortgage payments, and then again, repayment of other obligations that cannot be met due to revenue losses. And a very key point here on this up to $10,000 emergency grant is that it does not need to be repaid even if the applicant is subsequently denied the disaster loan. However, we do need to, to note that if that business does also go and get a PPP loan that Kristen was describing earlier, the amount of any loan forgiveness at the end of the PPP loan will be reduced by the $10,000 grant. So that's just something to not lose sight of. Um, and that brings us to an important point as well, is that a business can receive a disaster loan and or the grant, and it can also get a PPP loan. But the proceeds cannot be used for the same purposes. So in other words, there just cannot be any duplication in the uses of the funds that are obtained from a disaster loan and the grant, and then the funds that are used with respect to the PPP loan. So no double dipping. But again, there is an ability for small businesses to obtain relief under both of those programs. So I think right now what I'm going to do is just pause here and just see if Kristen has any additional talking points on the disaster loans before I move into just a very quick um, piece on the mid-sized loans. No, Jessica, I think you did a great job. The one thing in, in listening to you speak is I forgot to tell the terms of the PPP loans that are not forgiven. So the amount of the payroll protection loan that is not subject to forgiveness will be a two-year note carrying a 1% interest rate. So it'll be a, a, a short-term low interest cost loan to the extent it's not um, forgiven. So I apologize for not including that earlier, but um, Jessica, I think you're good to go to the mid-sized loans. Great. 
so that I think we can move on to the next slide. There we go. So for those businesses that may not qualify for small business relief under the CARES Act, um, we did just want to note for you that mid-sized businesses that have between 500 and 10,000 employees are eligible for other loans under the CARES Act. Um, we're still awaiting some additional guidance and for that program to officially roll out, um, but we do have some details to share with you. Um, the business must be incorporated, domiciled, has significant operations and a majority of employees in the US and can also not be a debtor in a bankruptcy proceeding. Um, but these loans are expected to be capped at an interest rate of 2% per annum. Uh, they will not be eligible forgiveness for forgiveness like the PPP loans. Um, and the collateral and the lending underwriting requirements will likely range from institution to institution, depending on uh, which one the borrower is working with on obtaining the loan funds. Um, but again, while we still have more details to come and we continue to monitor those developments, we did just want to make you aware that for those businesses who may not qualify for the small business relief, uh, there will be some mid-sized business relief uh, forthcoming uh, with respect to the CARES Act. And again, Kirsten, I know you've been following this as well. So if you have any additional uh, insight, I would welcome that. No, we're just to say we're still waiting for guidance on all of this. Um, I think Treasury and, well, Treasury, the SBA won't be in the mid-sized loan business, but the Treasury has been so focused on getting the Payroll Protection Act up and running that I think it'll, it, it, that the guidance will be in the next week or so. Great. So I think, uh, I think that covers what Kristen and I wanted to talk to you today about. And so I would hand that the remainder of the, the time that we have here over to Christina. Thank well you. Thank you so much, Jessica and Kristen, for the valuable information that you've provided. You have been such a great resource for our team and our clients during this period of time. Um, as I know, this is an extremely complex um, situation and ever-changing. So thank you guys for joining our call today. Uh, we do have, you know, obviously some questions from our attendees, but I know um, during just, we had only earmarked about 30 minutes for this call today. But I did want to extend if any clients or participants in this call have any questions specific to the materials in today's presentation to please reach out to either our team or Jessica and Kristen and I will provide their contact information if they, uh, you know, have any have any other additional questions. Is there anything else that that you guys want to add Jessica and Kristen. Not particularly. Um, yeah, I think just to thank you for your time on this and giving us the opportunity to get this information out to you guys. It continues to remain, as Kirsten was um, alluding to, or, or actually said, a very fluid situation. And so it is important to just continue to maintain those lines of communication with your bank and with your other partners. All right, great. Absolutely, yes, thank you very much. All right, well, you guys have a great rest of your day and everyone on the call have a great rest of your day as well.